Um, agriculture is at the core of any society that will prevail. And without an agricultural economy, inordinate efforts or incredible alternative luck must underpin that society's basic tenant to sustain the population, maintain order and find an alternate for trade. Throughout the history of mankind, civilizations have started or grown around the presence of an agricultural economy. The Fertile Crescent was known as such because of its capacity to provide cereals and other produce. Rome created the opportunity for the maintenance of a global empire without compare when it secured the grain supplies of Egypt. England reached out to countries over the seas and sent people such as Joseph Banks to inform London of alternate agricultural precincts. The Soviet Union jealously guarded the agricultural capacity of the Ukraine and the Black Sea, and some might suggest that, the Soviet, that uh, Russia still does the same today. Australia was a fluke of history. Its massive agricultural capacity remained undisturbed from global influence for tens of thousands of years, and Indigenous society for that time was the sole and unobstructed benefactor. Even today, we remain with vast, untapped capacity. No, we are not going to be the food basket of Asia. We couldn't even be the food basket of Indonesia. But we have had major advances from when Lachlan Macquarie took charge of an economy, which at that point in time was in, had serious questions raised over it. People were being asked whether it should be folded up and sent back to Liverpool. Great leaders and good governments of this nation have applied their minds to the sustenance and growth of our agricultural economy. And the actions of people such as Farah have used their God-given intellect to identify agronomic deficiencies and work out how to improve issues such as yield of grain and the type of soils it grows in. Builders in our nation, such as Deakin, Curtin, Chifley and Menzies, constructed dams that underpin both the food stock of electricity whilst creating the offtake for further food and securing the requirements of the agricultural precincts of the Lower Murrumbidgee and the Murray. In southern Queensland, taxation policy drove investment from an obscure in Australian terms and at times little-known crop called cotton to something that now rivals at times and exceeds the production of wool. This government, with its dams policy in northern Australia, the Northern Australia White Paper, and most importantly for this conference, the Agricultural White Paper, is already taking the next step. Prior to discussing this further, I think it is important to give a report card of basic commodity prices and how we have gone thus far. When we came to government, the price of a live, uh, live cattle steer was 165 cents per kilogram. The price today is 275 cents per kilogram. This means we've had a, a loading price for a 350 kg beast of just shy of, of $1,000 a head, which means a 67% increase. The price of grown steers has also gone up. Um, uh, through Gunnada, we look at uh, it going from 160 cents to 183 cents. I've just noted today, just before I started speaking, that the price of grown steers at Roma has gone uh, to close to 300, has uh, topped out at close to 393 cents a kilogram. These are record prices. The price of a bale of cotton in Australia when we came to power was $425 a bale. Now it's $525 a bale, a 23% increase. The price of an 18 to 24 fat score um, sheep has gone from a 211 cents to 352 cents a kilogram, or around $84 live. This is a 67% increase. Pork for a 60 to 75 dress weight wiener pig has gone from 308 cents to 315 cents. Price for even for goats has gone from 209 cents to 390 cents. That's an 87% increase and good news to all politicians. Milk at the farm gate from the Murray Goulburn has gone up slightly, but that has been in a time of turmoil where prices have been affected by um, the, the issues around the Ukraine and uh, the, the trade issues that surround that. Wool has, been, has fallen slightly, and it is an area where I have to put a lot more of my endeavours. But of course, as the Minister for Agriculture, you minister just as much for wool as you are for capskins, as you are for every part of that produce. 
Horticultural products such as Cavendish bananas have gone from $12.76 a carton to $28.85 a carton, a 126% increase. Uh, lemons have gone from $19.41 for a 12kg box to $50.20 per box, a 159% increase. Uh, kiwi fruit from $19.50 a bulk pack to $27.50 a bulk pack, a 41% increase. Yes, we've also had some disappointments. Oranges fell. Um, cherries have down because of some of the issues pertaining to Vietnam and peaches are down. But one can say, all in all, that we have been part of an historical turnaround in agricultural prices in this nation. As an anecdote, I believe that my job is best expressed in the dignity it brings back to people's lives at the farm gate. The whole purpose of my job and my department's job is not about our own personal gains our own personal misfortune, or our likes or dislikes, but our desire as a team to work together to make sure that the people we are paid to serve prosper by our endeavours. I think this is no better displayed when before Christmas, a lady northwest of Charters Towers contacted me and said, look, I rarely contact a politician and if I do, it's generally to complain. But I'm telling you that I'm loading bullocks now over $1,300 a head, paid for. And so we have money for Christmas. That is the sort of message that drives me. When a better return goes to the farm gate, the mother can afford to renovate her kitchen, like other people in cities can afford to renovate theirs. When a better price goes to the farm gate, the farmer can go on holidays, like other families go on holidays. When a better price goes to the farm gate, the farmer can refurbish his plant and equipment, rebuild his yards, rebuild the fences, Build better, buy better genetics, improve pastures, get better plant, increase their, their irrigation capacity. And as a collective, this refurbishes our nation's capital base to support the requirements we so often hear of. It is through money such as this as it makes its way into our nation's economy which will support the health care, support childcare, support pensions, support defence, education, police, and might I dare say, our own selves on top of the hill. When we talk about general employment across this nation and increasing the employment base, we must remove the rhetoric and understand where it actually happens. We must continually remind ourselves that the largest manufacturing sector in our nation is meat processing. The largest employer in regional Australia is abattoirs. When you go to an abattoir, you see that dynamic. You see that awe-inspiring view of sometimes four to five to six hundred people on a boning floor, almost like an industrial Olympics of uh, where people are working to quotas and working flat out. In some instances, you go to abattoirs where you will see thousands of people at work, thousands of people in high-vis suits, thousands of people with white helmets on, with overcoats, thousands of people taking home money for their, for their families, thousands of people, to be honest, who in other forms, if this form of work was not there, possibly wouldn't have a job. There is real dignity in what we do. It is better to be better at what you're good at than trying to conjure up skills that we know other nations have an intrinsic advantage in. We are good at agriculture. We are good at employing people in agriculture. We are good at research and development in agriculture. We have the highest yields of cotton in the world. We attain some of the highest prices for agricultural pr product in the world. We are known for our beef throughout the world. We are known for when people aspire to our branding because they see it as a quality product that they wish to buy. And in recent times, the largest proportion of growth and employment in this nation has been in agriculture. But unless you have the farms that are producing the product, then all else that follows is naught. Agriculture is a noble pursuit. It does not benefit from the weakness of others. It does not leave people diminished. It is the essence of what feeds and clothes them. As such, agriculture must not only economically be a pillar of the economy, but morally is a pillar of the economy. As it is fundamentally tied to the future of our nation, it is my belief that it should remain overwhelmingly and unambiguously the domain of the Australian farming family. The Australian farm owned by mums and dads like you. This is not only my desire, but overwhelmingly the desire of people from Blacktown to Geelong. To this purpose, we have reduced the level at which an individual must report to the Foreign Investment Review Board when they purchase land if they come from overseas. 
It will go from its current level of $252 million non-cumulative. That means that currently a person from overseas could buy a $250 million property every day of the week and never have to tell anybody about it. To $15 million, and that is cumulative. So if you buy a $14 million place one day and you desire to buy a $2 million place the next, it's not that you will be rejected, but it must be reviewed. The alternate government, the Labor Party, in some mysterious diversion, have said that the level should go from $252 million to a unilateral level of $1,000 million. Now, whether you're in Blacktown or Boulia or Ipswich or Bawarana, this idea is overwhelmingly rejected by the Australian people. One of the greatest attributes our nation has is a clean, green image. This is a selling point, not only in Australia, but overseas. In many countries that I've gone to, the reason the Australian product is preferred is not because it is cheaper, because it is not. It's because it is cleaner. Recent events have highlighted this in even clearer focus. The Australian people have asked for, and we will deliver, a clearer country of origin labelling system. A system that is diagrammatic, simple, reflects the proportionality of what is in the packet removed of fillers such as water, and also is compulsory. Current ambiguities, such as made in Australia from local imported ingredients, or made in Australia when it's not actually come from this nation at all, will be removed as a source of confusion for the consumer. For our nation to take the next step, we must invest in the infrastructure that underpins it. And this task has already started. The previous coalition government put $10 billion on the table for the refurbishment of the Murray-Darling Basin. And you can go now to places such as the Macquarie Valley and see this immense investment already paying dividends in straightened channels, in telemetric measuring, in taking away the, abs the absorbance so that the water that's there is the water you can use, and better irrigation plans. You can go to Mildura and see investments well in excess of $100 million in new lift pumps for more effective watering. You can go the length and breadth of the Murray-Darling Basin and see pivots, laterals and tr trickle irrigation taking the place of flood irrigation. You can see that investment also in other ways, such as the better yields that we are getting for cotton. If you can get more cotton from an acre of land, then inherently that is also a water saving. We invest around $700 million a year in research and development in agriculture. We make sure that our genetics remain at the forefront globally. Anecdotally, as an example of this, and recently, I was part of an announcement of $15 million to keep PhD students involved in Toowoomba at the GRDC. This process follows in the footsteps of Farah and developing better disease resistance and high yielding strains of grain. Dams are being constructed, from Chaffee Dam in the north to the most recent $200 million investment in water infrastructure in Tas Tasmania. This will continue to be rolled out in short order. The green paper on agriculture has been through Cabinet and the white paper is imminent. The Northern Australian white paper intersects these twos and likewise will soon be released. People might ask, why have these not been released sooner? And there's a simple answer to that. We want these documents to be formidable. We want them to make a difference. We want them to be beyond merely motherhood statements that adorn so many shells and crevices, collecting detritus, living obscurus per obscurum until they are finally shredded purposeless and unread. Ladies and gentlemen, I see this job as an incredible honour. I grew up on a farm. I was one of six kids. My father in his 90s and my mother in her 80s still live on the property. I own a property myself. I don't see this as a conflict of interest. I see this as real motivation. I've made it my objective not to live or die to be a politician, but to be judged as having made a difference. I am so proud that this government's, of this government because I believe for once is actually doing that. I get a sense of real purpose when I stand next to a Prime Minister who actually wants to do something. He's going to break away from what merely keeps him in a job and do that which, if we are, for, if we are forgotten, leaves our nation in a better place. I believe that is the essence of a purposeful life. My goal in agriculture is to make sure that whoever comes next and I hope that is not imminent, that they have a foundation to further build on. So the great and unending work of building a stronger Australia, a country which can support itself, feed others, sustain what we believe is morally proper, 
and to be a beacon to others in the rest of the world continues unobstructed. Thank you very much for your attention. All the best and God bless. Minister, thank you. What an impassioned case for agriculture this morning. In a moment, I might uh, change spots and go over to a microphone there and help direct traffic. The good news is we have got plenty of time for questions this morning. So uh, I'd ask you to come forward uh, to the microphone points that are in the aisle and uh, indicate that you're, you're keen to ask a question and uh, I'll take you in due course. I might break the ice first though because um, nobody likes breaking the ice, but Minister, um, it was an impassioned case for agriculture. You talked about agriculture being a noble profession. You made the case for the family farm in no uncertain terms. Uh, it was interesting, ABC Rural did a lot of coverage about the announcement recently. Surprisingly, there was a lot of reaction uh, on the other side of the, the, the question from uh, people around the country, particularly in Western Australia, with farmers saying, look, hang on, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, but is it that big an issue? So th that is my question to you. How important is the question of foreign ownership and um, do we really need to have strong controls? Um, well, obviously, if, if it wasn't, I wouldn't be putting my endeavours towards it. You must be a reflection, you must always be a reflection of what your constituent is asking for and put it through the filter of, of what is right and proper for the nation. Uh, but if I always base this on, I'll base this on two principles. I remember even in Queensland, in the uh, town uh, where I lived, where I lived prior to moving back home to, to Tamworth, uh, I asked, I said, show me the register that you have of foreign owned land in this district. And I got one. And the obvious one was there, obviously, Cubby Station. And there was uh, the uh, section of it. But I knew full well that that wasn't a complete register. I knew because I was an accountant in the town where the other properties were that were either owned via trust or owned by other mechanisms which were owned overseas. So even in a place where we're supposed to have transparency, it wasn't. The, the record was not complete. I'll back it up with another conversation I had with a real estate agent um, merely last week where he said to me, um, uh, and I was, before I was in politics, I was known as Joycey. He, he knew me from, from a long time ago. He said, Joycey, I like you and I hate you. I tell you what I like about you is all the tyre kickers out there who've been wandering around, not wanting to close on a deal, they're rushing in, they're closing. They're closing on the deal and they're settling. He said, that's good. He said, but I imagine when it's passed that uh, this will sort of um, create more caution in the market. But then he said something to me, he said, I think you will be overwhelmed, he said, because I know what around this district I have sold, and I have sold heaps. And it's not just the size of, um, it's not just the number, it, the ABS statistics, which I think are way below, have, are way below what the actual truth is, because to be honest, a lot of people, they just don't bother f filling out the ABS statistics if they don't think they want their story told, and I think it's only, I think it's, uh, just a little over 80 per cent actually return the, the ABS forms. But on those statistics alone, it's about 2 to 2.3, 2.3 times the size of Victoria is either now totally foreign owned or partially foreign owned. Now that in itself um, should ask some questions of us. And we will remain the most liberal nation on earth for investment. I had a meeting with uh, ASEAN ambassadors last week and we had this discussion. They were quite upfront about it. Uh, but my retort was this, is, well, can I invest um, in your respective countries in the way you can invest in mine? And the answer is overwhelmingly no, you can't. In some instances, not allowed to buy land at all. Now, this doesn't mean that we have, we have a right to the Australian people to make sure that we, are in, we have, have got proper transparency and proper control of their most vital asset, the land that they stand on. And um, if that brings me into conflict with certain sections, then so be it. That is it. As I've said before, this is more than just an economic argument. Because if you just want a purely economic argument, then um, we can go through a whole range of things. I mean, why do you need health care? Why do you need child care? We can have a whole range of economic arguments and completely change the dynamics of what this nation is. And it would be economically feasible. As an accountant, it would be economically prudent. I will save you. If you want me to be a purist accountant, I will save this nation a lot of money. 
and you will find the consequences lying on the street within a matter of years. Uh, but we are more than that. We are more than just purely an economic principle. We are a nation. And as a nation, we must look forward to the future of our nation. And of course, we must indelibly uh, have control and understand and respect and in times as required, protect the interests of our nation because it is more than just the commissions of this generation that need to be looked after. It is our nation and the future that must be protected. Minister, a question to your right. Yeah, good day. Barnaby, Dave Brownhill, farm from Liverpool Plains. Um, I congratulate your government on making all the commodity prices go up. Um, <laughs> a, a slight long bow. I'm, I'm hoping that I can make the Australian cricket team beat New Zealand sometime soon. But my question to you is, and I agree with everything you've said, and especially your last sentiment, but if we're going to look after agriculture, and you probably know where this question is going to come from, Liverpool Plains is a magnificent farming area. Mm -hmm. All farmers think they live in the best farming area. But I would argue, having travelled most of the world looking at farming, that Liverpool Plains is in the top ten places to farm in the world. Why are we going to get it mined? Sure. Um, I'm going to answer your question uh, in seriatim. The first part is I don't for one moment claim that the, the government is the sole responsibility for the increase in prices. However, it's vitally important that you understand the role the government has played to that purpose. Um, we talk about the three free trade agreements, and of course they've been signed for China, uh, for Korea and for Japan. But besides that, and without people watching, we've also um, opened up the uh, live trade into Egypt, Bahrain, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, Lebanon, and after four decades, Iran. And if I had wanted the support of the economic purists, I'd say when the emails turn up to my office, as they do by the thousands, asking for these trades to be closed down, for us to pull back, to us to not participate in our region as a Southeast Asian, but to start participating in our region as still uh, some enclave of Europe, then I'd say that that's where you should put your shoulder to the wheel. Make sure that we remain engaged in those markets, understanding our customer and trading with our customer. To the next part of your question, David, in regards mining, as you're well aware, uh, merely two days ago, I took Greg Hunt uh, to the Liverpool Plains and um, in dealing, uh, going, taking to those farmers, those ones with the, the most inherent concern, I said, uh, I'll take Greg Hunt to your kitchen, to your kitchen table, and if you give a, get a group and we have a succinct conversation about the issues for which the Commonwealth has oversight. We do not have oversight over whether people like mines or don't like mines, or whether they're too noisy or too dusty. We have a very small, small um, area which we have authority in, and that is predominantly in the hydrological question and the interference with aquifers. Um, to that purpose, Greg Hunt has now, as he said, stopped the clock for further information. Does this mean I'm against coal mining? Not at all. I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an accountant. Without coal mines, we go broke, and go broke very, very quickly. But we must understand, if we're going to even, once more, go to the economic argument, you must look at the forward cash flows that provided buy land on primary agricultural land. In some of those areas, David, and I know you understand this, but for the benefit of the rest of the, the crowd, are uh, collecting um, two tonnes of Durham wheat to the acre, so uh, about 560, so well over, um, well over a thousand dollar return for an acre of land. Thousand, so, um, so if you've got a thousand acres in and this person did, that's a million dollars, that's a million dollars a year for that crop. And remember, this is underpinned with a water right that sits beneath it. So you've got real security. And what also sits beside this is one of the last battles I had was the removal of um, uh, some of the water licenses, the restrictions of the water licenses, and we have seen a recharging of the aquifers in that area. So I think there's a special case that needs to be made, and I always go back to the key principles that um, agriculture should reign supreme when you're on primary agricultural land, when there's a threat of a destruction of an aquifer whether you're imposing on the quiet enjoyment of a person uh, who was already there. And there must be, there must be um, the respect of the property right of the farmer. Um, if you're not destroying an aquifer, and if you're not on primary agricultural land, and that certainly is not the Breezer Plains, where it is primary agricultural land, and where it, there is, um, obviously, with the, inter, the, inter, um, the inter reaction between Goron Lake and the, and the Mukai River, and the working aquifer which underpins that agricultural precinct, 
Um, but if you're not destroying an aquifer and if you're not on primary agricultural land, then I think the negotiation has to respect the right of the farmer being a partner in the business. And I'm referring to here coal seam gas. Um, why is that? Because hydrocarbons material was initially vested with the landholder. It is not like gold, silver and iron ore, which was always vested with the Crown. Hydrocarbonous material, coal, oil, gas, was initially an asset of the land. It was divested from the land in part. Um, in, in, in Queensland, the 1915 Petroleum Act. Uh, in, the in the territories, it was 1953. In South Australia, 1971. And the last vestiges of the ownership of coal rights in New South Wales were taken away by Neville Rand in 1983. So uh, let's dispense from our mind that this asset was never owned by the landholder initially was, taken from them without so much as a cent of payment. And then we seem to transfer from you know, raving free marketeers to unrepentant communists that we believe it's our right to go onto a person's place and take from them an asset that we formally stole off them without them complaining. Uh, that just won't work. Minister, there's another question up the top to your right. Thank you, Minister Joyce, for your um, talk. Um, I'm coming at this, shifting gears a little bit with this next question, but it's something that's been in the news quite a lot. Can I just grab your, grab your name? Sure, yep, I'm about to say that. So um, I'm Wendy Umberger. I'm an associate professor at the University of Adelaide, um, and I'm actually an economist there. So I run a group called Global Food Studies. So I'm, I'm asking this question, I guess, with two hats. Um, one is my academic hat, someone that does a lot of research on looking at consumer, um, consumer interest in food labeling, um, understanding consumer demand for food labels. I'm on the program later today. But also wearing the hat of a mother um, with a young child who had some of the berries um, in their freezer. Um, and so I've been paying a lot of attention, been actually asked to comment a couple of times on, on the proposed new food labeling law. And um, I understand where you're coming from, but I guess I have some concerns and, and it would be good to hear from you. Um, about why, why um, what you're proposing with respect to the percentages um, on the labels, why that's going to get at the issue of, if this is a policy issue of food safety, how this new type of label, labeling being proposed would actually address that food safety issue any better than what's currently there. Um, that being said, I completely agree. There needs to be some, some changes in food labeling, but I don't, I really, um, and can say that with evidence, from research we do, I don't think that's going to solve the issue. So just some comments would be appreciated. Thanks. Sure, Wendy. Um, the first thing about, uh, Wendy, about food labelling is honesty. I mean, if we, if we believe it's worthwhile putting it on the packet, then surely we believe that it's worthwhile honestly putting it on the packet. Um, Wendy, as you know, um, we, have, uh, we, we tell people their essential daily intake. We tell them how much carbohydrate. We tell them how much sugar. We tell them its weight. We tell them it's used by date. In many instances, we tell them whether it's halal certified or not. Um, and then we tell them we have this sort of uh, obscure terminology of made from Australian imported ingredients. What are, Wendy, what on earth does that mean? What on earth does that term mean? Does it mean 1%, 2%, none? Does it mean one peanut and a packet of peanuts came from this nation? Um, we then said made in Australia, and we've seen, Wendy, recent examples of the fish that was caught in the Atlantic, taken to China, processed there, taken to New Zealand, processed there, put in a package in Australia and labelled made in Australia. Right. Wendy, why do they want to put the word Australia on it? Why do they want to put the word Australia on it? Because it sells. Because it sells. So what we're asking for is honesty. I've got no problems if people want to buy something from overseas or not. But I have a right as a consumer to know. And what am I buying when I buy that? Well, I'm buying the right to know that it was farmed just like, just like you know, uh, when we're selling the product to China. The reason our product sells in China so well is because of its clean image, Wendy. I'm buying the right to know that it has one of the highest level of phytosanitary controls in the world, that it's been farmed in an area with one of the highest levels of phytosanitary controls in the world. I know that it's had one of the highest levels of occupational health and safety backing that in from the farm to the processing sector. I know that the wages that were paid, that were paid, were paid at a decent rate to support, um, to support people in a decent way of life. Um, I think I have, I have the right as a consumer to know that information. And I have the right not to be misled by, to be honest, weasel words, which basically get the word Australia on it, when in fact, if they're honest, it's not really Australian at all. 
Now, this doesn't mean that there are not products there. Of course, there'll be a whole range of products. We're a trading nation. But this nation has the right to, uh, to display uh, in an unambiguous form what is there. The second part of your question, Wendy, was to how does it deal with issues such as uh, the, hepatitis, the hepatitis A issue when we were talking about recent issues. Well, I think, first of all, um, to get the facts about hep hepatitis A, it's um, most people, a lot of people who consume berries are not going to get hepatitis, probably about 1%, um, uh, if, if they were infected. The only reason that uh, you get hepatitis from, from berries is because it's part of the oral faecal route, and therefore um, your registers such as E. coli uh, you know, have to be detected. Um, and as a protection from that, you have to have an understanding of exactly, if, if it gives you some form of insurance that if you have a concern to be able to shop to know where um, you, if, if you believe that is a risk, where you can go to buy to mitigate that risk. That is, I think, a disclosure document that um, any product should be allowed to have. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, uh, it's in our interest. If we, alternatively, if we don't believe in product of origin labelling, if we believe that it's a level, if we believe that all things are the same, then we should go back to our farmers and say, you also can work at the same level of control as your competition can, can work at. And no one in Australia would accept that. So let's be honest about how we display it on our package. 